Welcome back to Shrinking Classics. I'm your host, Caleb Nelson. I have a degree in, in psychology. And me and Charles Dickens, we're, we're best buds. Uh, but he just doesn't know that yet because he died. Or maybe, maybe he knows it and I don't know that he knows it. One day I'll find out. Yes, maybe he does know. Um, Leslie Nelson, I also have the honor of being Caleb's mom. And I aspire to to knit coats into my knitting like Madame Defarge. I like it. Solid. And we're, we will be getting into those codes this week because this week we talk about... Uh, last week we had a lot of the buildup and now we have the downhill side of Tale of Two Cities where things start to go, uh, you know, not so well for our characters. Although in, in good news, things start by going really well for some of them. But we'll start by doing a quick recap of the last episode uh, for anyone who didn't watch that or may, may have just forgotten. Uh, so a quick summary is, I'll see if I can actually do a quick summary. A quick summary would be that we started out by learning that Lucy's father, Dr. Manette, was stuck in the, in the Bastille prison, wrongfully, for 19 years, buried alive. And we talked about how one of the major themes in the book is recalled to life and resurrection. And so we, and so when, uh, when Lucy found out that her dad was still alive, they went and they recalled him to life. They being Lucy and Mr. And Mr. Lori. And so he was recalled to life. He's doing great. And now they are no longer in France, but they're in, in England. And, on the way from England, then they met Charles Darnay on the boat, and Lucy and Charles became friends. And they also met Sidney Carton, who is a uh, he's kind of like a bum. If that's that's kind of the way to think about him, he he has a home, as far as we know, but he has bum like behavior. He's always drunk, and he's just kind of a low life. He he's not someone that you really want to be around because he's a bad influence. If you had he's kids, sloppy dressed, right. If you had, and, if you had time, kids, you wouldn't want him there. England, where that was a big deal that you that's true to go out in public appropriately. Right. If you ever, if you've ever seen a BBC depiction of really any show, and they're always super well dressed, and Sidney Carton is not one of those people. He's one of the people that you're that you go to the other side of the street if you see him coming. We find that he has a good heart. It's just he didn't know that yet either, and so. That's that's the basics. That's what's most important about what we talked about last week. Unless there's anything missed, did you anything that you would like to throw in there? Well, I think my favorite part of last week was when we talked about the doctor's PTSD and dissociation, and like that's too long for us to recap now. But if anybody missed it, I think it's totally worth going back, humbly speaking, and listening to that part. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a fascinating part of the book, and it's. It is often missed. Uh, I don't think people talk about that, and that's too bad because I think it's a fairly good depiction. Uh, granted, I could be wrong, but it seems pretty. It seems like a pretty good depiction. So check it out. Check out the last. Check out the last episode. And now, this week, we start by learning a little bit more about Charles and Lucy's relationship. That being that it is, it's growing and it's going well. So Charles, in the first few chapters, we have. He goes and he talks to, to Dr. Manette and he tells him, hey, look, uh, I don't know how to say this, but I really love your daughter and I want to marry her. But I also, I, I recognize how big of an impact she has had on your life. And I don't want to take her from you. If anything, I want to help and make sure that our, all of our lives can coincide and we can live together and con continue to be happy together. Which is which is fantastic. That's you know that's what just about every dad wants is to be able to still have a really close relationship with his daughter after she's married. And so it's very noble and honorable of Charles who to say that he's not just going to take her; he's going to share her. Which is, like I said, very noble. Charles, he he's in a sense in in these stories he's a sim he's a symbolism of nobleness and duty and. And honor he because he just does all these really noble noteworthy things like 
he turned down all of his inheritance from France because of how uh, how how the rich were using their funds. He said, "You know what? I don't want it. I renounce it." And he left it and left it to anyone who was there to have it when it was their time. So he and he went to England to be a, basically be an English teacher and just be a tutor. So really great guy. Before we started, then you had mentioned actually that it was interesting that there's so many different suitors for Lucy. Uh, Maybe you want to just kind of talk about that real briefly. Oh, well, I did think it's funny that uh, Sydney's partner, what's his name? The other lawyer? Yeah, Mr. Striver. Mr. Striver, Sydney, and Charles, three suitors for Lucy. And I just read in October, I read Dracula again, and there's a character named Lucy that has three suitors. So I just thought that was kind of humorous. <laughs> what is it with these women with three suitors at once? <laughs> right. And I'm pretty sure she was also blonde. So that's, that's <laughs> funny. Uh, so I also just as a quick aside. So Mr. Striver is often called the lion and Car- and Carton is Sidney Carton. He's referred to as the jackal. The reason for that is because when a lion hunts, then they often take down the big prey, whereas the jackal works with the lion and is kind of more of a scavenger and kind of picks up the scraps. And so it's kind of a a going joke between the two of them that that Sidney Carton is is the jackal riding on Mr. Striver's coattails, but at the same time they help each other out. And so when you're reading it, you'll see that there he's referred to as the jackal and that's why. So just want to throw that in there for any of you that were that ever were wondering. It's not just a neat nickname. It does have a purpose. And now, so now, but but to the meat of the story, when Charles is actually asking for Lucy's hand in marriage, that while he's talking to Dr. Manette, he he starts to tell Dr. Manette, he says, uh, you know, if if you're gonna agree to let me be your son-in-law, if Lucy feels the same, of course, then you should know the full truth. You should know that my name isn't actually Darnay. And he starts to tell him, but the doctor, he actually like literally puts his hands to his ears so that he won't hear it. He's like, nope, nope, I don't, I don't want to, don't tell him, don't, don't do it. And, and Charles being honorable, he's like, no, I really, I want to be honest with you. I want you to know everything. And, but the doctor I think he he has a sense that there is he must have suspected right he he suspects I'm sure that he doesn't actually want to know his real name and so he tells Charles he says you know what no don't tell me unless you guys end up getting married and then tell me on your wedding night and we'll go and we'll go from there but for now I don't want to know keep it between you promise and don't tell Lucy either and that's that and so they move on uh, and then Sydney comes over and visits Lucy and he talks to her and it really just shows how endearing of a character Sydney really is. Cause when he's talking to Lucy, then he, he starts to kind of tell her just a little bit about himself and, and his feelings and he gets, he gets emotional and Lucy's like, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to do when people get emotional and especially Sydney, who's this guy who like we talked about, he's kind of not someone that you would peg as an emotional type, but he, he talks to her and he says, I'm like one who died young. All my life might have been, which goes again into our recalled to life theme throughout this book. And, you know, I'm going to skip ahead, but it is really interesting because later in the story, you actually get a little, just, just a paragraph of Sydney's background. And it talks about how he actually had, he was actually getting into a pretty good position in life. I'm trying to see if I can look, find it real quick, but he was doing well. Yeah. Conveniently enough, I found it. It says long ago when he had been a, when he had been famous among his early com- competitors as a youth of great promise, he followed his father to the grave and his mother had died, had died years before. And so that's it. That's that's when Sydney, in a sense, died. It's when his parents died. He he wasn't able to cope with that grief, that grief. And so 
like Charles Dickens says, he followed his father to the grave. His last surviving parent, Sidney Carton, had great potential to do really well. But due to his family circumstances and his inability to cope with that tragedy and that bereavement, then he chose to continue to just kind of bottle it down and just turn to being an alcoholic. And so he, when he says, I'm like one who died young, it's because from an early age, he died with his parents. And I, I just think that's really cool because I don't remember reading that before. And this is my fourth time reading this. So that's just a neat thing. I thought that was like, ah, finally, we, we get to know a little bit of why Sydney is the way that he is. And that was really exciting for me, but also really sad. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because somehow I missed that. And I was wondering what happened to Sydney because he became a lawyer. So obviously he at some point had some, you know, ambition. And anyway, that that's just so tragic. Bless his heart. And I think that's a common um, problem. Like nobody, you know, sets out to become an alcoholic. Like, hey, that's my goal in life, right? But I'm sure he he drank as a way of dealing with his emotional pain, and then just kept drinking more and more, and so sad. Right. Yep. And 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 that's the danger that we all have is that we all have that potential to die young if we're if we're not able to uh, appropriately cope with the issues around us and i feel like that is a, a theme throughout this story is that if you can't cope with your current situations or your past or your future then you are inclined to die at an earlier age though you may not physically die you you die in a uh, personal sense just like dr manette did when he was in the prison he couldn't cope with uh, the torture of being in solitary confinement for 18 years for being wrong and being wrongfully uh, convicted and so in a sense he died and this happened to a few different characters but it also happened but like like we're going over it happened to sydney too that he couldn't cope with the despair and so he bottled it up and by and bottled it up and drank bottles of alcohol. And this could happen to anyone who is unable to cope. So that I, I just really feel like that's the message. But it's more than that, that it's you not just are able, you, you don't just die, but you in turn have a chance to be recalled to life. And you notice that almost every character in this book is in some way recalled to life by Lucy who is a symbol of compassion and love, which I think Charles Dickens is trying to say that though things are tough and that you may have made mistakes or had mistake, had bad things happen to you, it's not the end. You can still have a chance at life if you notice what's around you, notice somebody to cherish and have someone who cares about you. And it's that's an ongoing theme throughout this. So if, if you've read this before or you're reading it now, Look for that theme, and, and I, I think you'll see it. And if you don't, well, then maybe you find another theme. And let us know, because I think I that's one of the great things about classics. Oh, absolutely. And I love that. It's very tragic, the things that happened to some of the people, but also beautiful. The recall to life theme is beautiful. You know, there's just a lot of hope in that. Right. And now, now with that being said, we're going to get to something a little bit less beautiful, and that is, oh, but one one last note is, uh, while Sydney is talking to Lucy, she asks him, can I not recall you? And in a sense, recall you to life. She literally says, can I not recall you? And Sydney basically says, yeah, no, I'm hopeless. I, I, I can't be done. But I do promise you that if there's ever any way that I could uh, die for someone you love, then I'll do it. And just know that there's always someone out there who will give his life for you. And basically with that, he just leaves. And so Lucy's like, what the, what just happened? And then, so later at some point, then Charles and Lucy and Dr. Manette are all out and Charles makes some kind of rude comments about Sydney because you know they just don't really get along. 
is probably a little bit of jealousy because Sydney Sydney likes to hang around their house. And so I think I think Charles gets a little bit uncomfortable with another guy hanging around his wife so often. But one one night she talks to him and she's like, hey, I, I really don't appreciate the way you've been talking about Sydney. Just know that he's actually a really great guy. I can't tell you why, because he he made me promise not to tell his secret, but just know that he deserves respect. And Charles says, Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was I was being rude and I will I'll stop. And he does. He does. And so, anyways, with that, we're gonna move on from that storyline because we got to keep rolling. And we're gonna get back to talking about mob mentality, which is like it's just a total shift. You go from this beautiful imagery of being recalled to life through love and compassion to and hope and right, right, butterflies and rainbows. And now we're talking about mobs and blood and knives and and rich aristocrats being fed grass until they die. You know, just total switch. But that's the story, the tale of two city, two cities, the juxtaposition, and that's that's one of those cool things. I was just thinking that, Caleb, it's just like the first, the opening lines that everyone knows, the best of times, the worst of times. Yeah. And that's what you have throughout the story of these beautiful hope. And then you have this despair, you know? Oh, just powerful. Right. And so now the mob mentality, there's a line in here. It says, for the crowd in those times stopped at nothing. It was a monster much dreaded. Uh, and then... And then it says that the transition to the sport of window breaking and thence to the plundering of public houses was easy and natural. This was the usual progress of the mob. <laughs> I just, that's just fast. I just love it because that it, that's just how mobs work. It's, is it, it is a progression, but it doesn't seem that wild when you're in the moment. So just as a kind of funny little note, there was... When I was in college, there was a power outage, like for the whole city. And everybody just went out into the streets and they didn't do anything terrible because I, I was going to school at um, Brigham Young University in, in Idaho. But at the, still, people made jokes that it was the Mormon purge because everyone was just running out in the streets. All the lights were off. People were jumping on signs and just doing like, you know, just college kids stuff, nothing, nothing terrible, no vandal, no vandalization, nothing illegal. But the fact that they, people got out there and they were doing things that they wouldn't just do if they were alone, but because there were so many people around and hyping each other up, then it was, it was like, it was like Charles Dickens says, this was the usual progress of the mob. And you read on new, you read on the news, you see on the news, these stories about these terrible things that these mobs do to businesses or buildings or people or whatever it may be. And you're like, who are these people? Why are they? And like, like, for example, people robbing Target. It's like, what did Target do to them? Well, nothing. It's just, this is the natural pr progression of the mob. And now granted, there are peaceful protests. I'm not trying to say mobs and protests are bad. I am trying to say that they can be dangerous. And it's just one of those interesting things about human psychology and sociology is that when you be, get in a group, you get into the group think and the mob mentality, and you are somehow a little bit less on, in control of what you do than you think you are. And so that's something that yeah. is interesting. You know, I think something that, that uh, fits in there that people, most people could relate to is like when you're at a concert or a sporting event. Right. Like, for example, this is kind of embarrassing, but uh, I went to an ice hockey game a couple times with with my daughter and I can't explain it. But when you get caught up in the excitement, you know, in ice hockey, sometimes they get going and they'll be fighting. And we're like, yeah, yeah, get him, get him, get him. Right, right. And, the best you know, part. Later I look, look back on that and I go, well, so I think I don't want them to fight. That's terrible. <laughs> But at the same time, there's also this part of me. It's like, yeah, even now remembering, I'm like, yeah, get him, hit him, hit him. Right, like, right. That's that's not really who I am, but I got caught up in the moment with the crowd and we're all cheering and good times. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah like sporting events, concerts, you get a little bit of that crowd mentality going, I think. And not necessarily in a bad way, but it's a can give you an idea how you get caught up in the momentum. Yeah, 
Exactly. Exactly. And, and so that's one of those things that we learn in this story is that mob mentality, it can be very dangerous. And we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more uh, in a couple sections. But right now, I want us to take a second and read a passage that is one of my favorites in the whole book, just because of the, just the, the funny nature of it. Uh, one of the things that I like about Charles Dickens is that he's, uh, I think, and this is a, a professor said this, that I think his name is John Milton, but he says that Charles Dickens is funny when he, when he doesn't need to be, or when he's not supposed to be. And so in this example, it's when Jerry Cruncher is going out and he's he's a resurrection man. So he's going to dig up bodies for science, basically, to sell body parts to doctors or to sell bodies to doctors so they can do some experimenting. Uh, if you've read Frankenstein, that's kind of that kind of connects there. But it's not a very noble profession, and that's part of why no one really talks about it. But little Jerry, uh, Jerry Cruncher's son wanted to know why his dad always had rust on his fingers and mud on his boots, even though the bank doesn't have mud. And so he he snuck out and followed him one night and went to a graveyard and saw him dig up a coffin. And, and then this passage comes in, and I'm going to read it because I just think it's just one of the best passages in the book. Story aside, just out of pure passage, I think it's great. All right. So it says he he was so frightened being new to the site that he made off, that he made off again and never stopped until he had ran a mile or more. He would not have stopped then for anything less necessary than breath, it being a spectral sort of race that he ran and one highly desirable to get to the end of. He had a strong idea that the coffin he had seen was running after him and pictured as it was hopping on behind him, bolt upright, upon his narrow end, always having the point of overtaking him and hopping at his side, perhaps taking his arm. It was a pursuer to, to shun. It was, it was an inconsistent and ambiguous fiend, too. For while he was making the whole night uh, behind him dreadful, he darted out into the, into the roadway to avoid dark alleys fearful of its coming and hopping out of them like a dropsical boy's kite, which just as a note, uh, dropsy is when a person kind of becomes swollen. And so a dropsical boy's kite is just saying that it was a kite, but a very swollen looking one. So the size of a coffin. Uh, anyways, like a dropsical boy's kite without a tail and wings. It hid in doorways too, rubbing its horrible shoulders against the doors and drawing them up to his ears as if it were laughing. It, it got into the, into the shadow of the road and lay cunning on his back to trip him all, all, this, all this time. He was inconsistently hopping on behind, behind him or hopping on behind him and gaining on him so that the boy, when he got to his own door, had reason for being half dead. And even then, it would not leave him, but followed him up the stairs with a bump on every stair and, and scrambling into bed with him bumped down dead and heavy on his breast when it fell when he fell asleep that's so, so good <laughs> how can you not want to read this book it's got passages like that so like i said and that one it doesn't really have that passage doesn't have much to do with the story although that moment when when jerry pulls the coffin out uh, they find out that it's empty and he blames his wife because she was praying against him as he says and but it, it actually does help in the story. If if you've read the book, then you find out that it's because that very coffin was supposed to be filled with someone named Roger Cly, who was a spy. And but because there because Jerry knew that there was no one in that coffin, they knew that he faked his death. And that in turn gives um Sidney Carton some leverage at the end of the book, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But for the time being, we're going to talk about the wedding. See, always back and forth, juxtaposition in every corner. And now, so Charles and Lucy are about to get married. So the night has come that Charles is supposed to tell Dr. Manette his true name. And now when he does this, then 
they both walk out of the room and Dr. Manette seems kind of pale and he's, uh, and everyone's a little bit worried about him, but fortunately Lucy and Charles are so focused on the wedding that, that they don't even really notice. But after the wedding, when, when they leave, then the next morning, when Mr. Laurie comes there, he sees that Dr. Manette is no longer Dr. Manette. But once again, he's, he's, uh, 105 North Tower. He's got his, his shirt all undone and he's working at the shoemaking uh, bench, which he had kept. And this goes on for, I think, nine, nine days, maybe 11 days while Charles and Lucy are on, are on their honeymoon, which they knew they didn't know about because they don't want to bother them. But then they, uh, but then Mr. Laurie, and Dr. Burnett, they have a dialogue when the doctor or just kind of somewhat miraculously just comes back to himself. And Mr. Laurie, he, he, he talks to Dr. Burnett in kind of cryptic terms because he doesn't want to push anything. He doesn't want to trigger him. But he, he says, uh, in a sense, he says, so, doctor, I, I have this friend and I need your opinion on him as a doctor. And. Dr. Manette is kind of, he's kind of picking up what's going on because he's noticed that things are a little bit different. He's lost basically nine to 11 days of time. And, you know, like kind of like, it's, you can kind of see that things are a little bit different. And so when Mr. Laurie starts to talk about how he had a friend who had quite a, a shock, then Dr. Manette is like, it was a mental shock if I, if I'm right. And, and Mr. Laurie's like, yes, it was, it was a mental shock. And he mentions that there's times where he's slipped back into a basically a previous persona. And he he asks the doctor if he's worried that it'll happen again. And the doctor says, oh, it could happen again to that friend. I think the friend was probably afraid of it for some time. And but what I like is in the next part of the conversation, then they talk about the shoemaker's bench, which we talked about in the last episode and how it was bizarre that he kept it. But what the, what Dr. Manette says is that the, the shoemaker's bench was something that he, that was a very precious possession to him in the Bastille because it was something that he really needed and worked hard to get. And when he got them, it became who he was. And so it's not that easy to just get rid of. But Mr. Laurie, being a smart man, he he's, I think he's like, what is he, like 72 at this point in the book. Yeah, and, yeah, 70 something. Right. And so he says, he says, I, I hear that, but I do think it would be wise to get rid of your crutches, basically, and walk on your own. And Dr. Manette says, ah, no, you're you're probably right. So, but don't do it while I'm here. Wait until I'm gone for some time and and do it then. That way I don't see you doing it because that might trigger relapse. And and so they do. And it's it's a fascinating passage when uh yeah, so it's it's fascinating when uh Mr. Laurie and Miss Pross go to, in a sense, kill the bench. Because it says, or so it was a night when uh, Lucy had come back, and so Lucy and Charles and the doctor, they all went, and they basically gone uh, for a weekend. And it says, on the night of the day which they left the house, Mr. Mr. Lorry went into his room with a chopper, a saw, a chisel, and a hammer, attended by Miss Pross carrying a light. There, with with closed doors and, and in a mysterious and guilty manner, Mr. Lorry hacked the shoemaker's bench to pieces. While Miss Pross held the candle as if she were were an assisting in a murder, for which, indeed, in her grimness, she was no unsuitable figure, and which you know this is this is fascinating because it's another way of talking about being recalled to life is that they've just buried the life that uh, was that came on in the prison, so. Dr. Manette goes from Dr. Manette to uh, 500 or 105 North Tower 
And now 501 North Tower is being, in a sense, buried. And in hopes that it will, that Dr. Manette will stick around for good now. What are you, what are your thoughts on all of that? Um, agree, disagree? Oh, I like that. I like what you said. I understand why, why uh, Mr. Lori thought it'd be a good idea to get rid of the shoemaker's bench, but, uh, I don't think it was a good idea. I think that that's, um, I think well-meaning people <laughs> have ideas about what will help people that have experienced trauma that, but they don't really know. And often they say or do things that are not actually helpful because of their lack of experience. But they mean well. And I think Mr. Lori meant well, but I think he was wrong to take away the shoemaker's bench. Because like the doctor said, it was something that gave him comfort. Like, like I think Dr. I mean, Mr. Lori was associating that if he had the bench, that might pull him back to that state. But I look at it differently. I feel like when he's in that state, that bench was a comfort to him. He needed that. And he just, I don't think they should have taken it away. But that's my yeah, my opinion. No, I, different opinions are great. Because, yeah, because it's, it's good because I, I kind of think that it was good that they got rid of it. But that's just my opinion. So it's wonderful that we can disagree on it. I think that's kind of fun. Uh, so yeah. any more thoughts yeah. on that? <laughs> any more thoughts on that? If not, then we'll jump over and talk about uh, Madame Defarge and the brewing revolution. Yes, let's do that. Okay. So while while in England, things are going great. Uh, in France, things are less great. And at the center is Mr. and Madame Defarge. And I don't know why particularly they're at the center, except for that they seem to be the central hub of, uh, I think I think that they're called the Jacqueries, which uh, a lot of the French revolutionists call each other Jacques, which in a sense just means kind of peasant or commoner, saying that we're all peasants and we all need to work together. And so they they kind of work, they kind of like organize all this revolution the best they can in their way. And Madame Defarge, she is pretty pivotal in it because she keeps track of everybody that they need to, that she wants to have killed. And she does it in a pretty fascinating way. And if you don't know what she's doing, then you you miss it. Just like everyone who is around her does, except for I think Sydney. I think Sydney actually picks up on it. And Sydney is he's very astute and attentive. And he notices what's going on uh later. But but uh Mama, you want to talk about the interesting way in which Madame Defarge kind of keeps track and notes down everyone that needs to, you know, have their head chopped off. Oh yes. I love that part. She actually knits codes. She somehow knits it into, puts it into her knitting names and whatever she wants to remember in some kind of code in her knitting. And what's really fascinating about that is that that's not just something that Charles Dickens made up out of his imagination there were women spies in the past who actually did that. They That's would, crazy. they made up codes and they would put in their knitting and they could pass along to other people who also knew the codes. And so I just think that's a little, I've done a little uh, research on that because I love knitting. And so I was fascinated by that idea. And so, yeah, that was a real thing that women have done to help in various war efforts throughout time. And that's what she was doing. Just and I love the idea, you know, she's just like, oh, I'm just a woman here knitting. Don't pay attention to me. And really, she's like this secretary writing down notes in this black book, you know, and terrifying. Right. Yeah, yeah. And and yet she at one point she meets with uh John Barsad and he who is a spy and he 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 he's the one who ends up getting um who ends up being able to work with 
uh, Sydney to help Charles. And, but it's because he's a spy. But so uh, Madame Defarge, she, she's knitting while talking to him. And I think she actually tells him that if if he's not careful, then she's going to knit Barsard into her register. <laughs> and that freaks him out appropriately. And now... Yeah, he know, should be freaked out. <laughs> right. Especially in those times, because when the mob takes power, which is what we're about to talk about, everybody's at risk. It, whether you're royalty or not, then you're at risk because if someone just denounces you and says that you've done something, then you go to prison and then have some sham of a trial and then you get your head cut off and yeah and so they, they the the mob they just go through and they they just take out everybody they take out all the aristocracy they take out anyone who's related to them they take out anyone who even worked for them and it's just the list goes on and on and they killed thousands of people just because they were richer than them and it's just such, such a shocking mentality to be able to just say, oh, yeah, no, this is this is good. This is OK. I'm, I think that we're doing the right thing. But it's just it just, it just baffles me. Um, do you have any thoughts on that and like how people get to be so detached from whatever it may be that they can make this happen? You know. Well, that's an interesting question. It reminds me of the uh, Stanford prison experiment. Right. You know, where they simulated a prison in like a basement of a college dorm and they had just college students and they had to stop the experiment early because the guards were excessively brutal. And the most fascinating part to me was that the, that, uh, What's his name that was running? Dr. Zimbardo. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I think I'm saying his name wrong. My apologies to him. But uh, anyway, he got caught up in it himself. I mean, he, he's been heavily criticized for that. But I admire him because he admits it. You know, he's like, oh, yeah, I got totally sucked into my own experiment. And, you know, that just shows how powerful this is. I mean, he doesn't deny it. He knows that's what happened. And uh, at one point, his his girlfriend or then fiance told was broke up with him because she's like, you're not the man I thought you were because he had invited her to come mm. in and be part of the experiment as a pretend to be a social worker. And so she came in and she saw what was going on and she was absolutely appalled. And she's wow. like, you're not the man I thought you were and broke up with him. And that was kind of what snapped him out of it. So getting back to the book, I think sometimes, you know, he has a whole whole book about this, but uh, how sometimes you can just get caught up in that kind of like you were saying, it's like the mob mentality, on a little bit different level because it's not. You're not in that moment, but you are and you just get sucked up in it. Like you said, you, I think we have to be careful, you know, the people that you're around have more influence on you than you might think. Right. And so you want to make sure that you, you know, surround yourself with people that you want to emulate because you might be uh, influenced in them in more ways than you realize. Yeah. And no, that, that's great. I think that that's what happened. It was just like everybody's doing it hard to yeah really hard to put into words how that works but i think we probably all experienced that like especially in our school days you know the peer pressure thing right and there's, there's of, a whole side a of greater degree yeah there's this whole side of conformity uh there's been studies that have shown that it's uh, just about 70 percent of people will conform to something even if they don't believe it's true because right. they don't want to be the black sheep and that's right yeah and and so that i and so yeah i agree that's probably largely what's going on because i'm i'm sure not every single peasant in france was going around waving butcher's knives but maybe 70 percent of them were and that's a big percent that's a huge percent like you can't yeah, even flip even a coin and get that percentage reliably the ones that weren't probably didn't dare admit that they weren't 
because otherwise they could mm-hmm. be next. Yeah, exactly. Because then they wouldn't be a good Republic of France. Right. And then that increases the perception that everyone is doing this. Yeah, exactly. And normalizes that. Which, yeah. which we do see Very. in, even in our day right now, we see that going on. That's That's exactly what politics is about. Politics is all about trying to convince everybody that everybody believes this. And if you don't, then it's because you're wrong and you should change. But we're not going to yeah. get into politics. That's, that's just a tactic that politicians use and has been around on, forever. On both sides, yeah. Yeah, both sides. Both sides, of course. Uh, and now, and now, so back to the story. As the mob is going through just like destroying structure and creating and rebuilding it, basically, then if you can call it rebuilding it with the just the chaos of the mob, but it is an organized chaos, which is just just wild they they go through and they they just they they kill the uh the marquis saint evermont who is in fact charles father uh and his uncle it might not be his father but i'm sure he dies too but this one is specifically his uncle who is killed and then so then his estate is taken over by the peasants which is perfectly fine with charles because that's what he wanted he wanted the he wanted the estate and the land to go back to the peasants because it was theirs to begin with. But in that process, then they take um, the basically Charles's friend and the, the servant and put him in prison and say that unless you can get Charles to vouch for you and say that you weren't actually helping or whatever it was, doesn't matter. But Charles, then we're going to kill you. <laughs> right. And so Charles gets a letter saying that he needs to go back to save Cabell. And Charles being a good guy, but I guess a little bit ignorant in this case. Naive, he, I would say. <laughs> right. He he goes back. He thinks that he's safe. And now at this time, it was six years after they were married. They and Lucy and Charles, they have a six-year-old daughter, daughter, also named Lucy. And so he leaves them thinking that he'll be able to just go save Gabelle and come back and it'll all be fine. He goes with Mr. Laurie because oh, Mr. Sure. Laurie had business. Yeah. You know, I think. We have to remember, we have the benefit of hindsight. We know True. the history. Because as I was reading this, I'm like, oh, Charles, what are you doing? Don't, 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 don't go to French. You're right. so stupid. Why? Stay right? with your wife. Yeah. Yeah. But hindsight, you know, I mean, he was, it was a noble thing. He was going to help his friend. And he really, at that stage, could not have known how bad things were. Right. They are in a different side of the country. They don't have social media. They don't have TV. Yeah. So they can't just know. They just hear what people say. Yeah, so, so that's true. Heard some things because I he mentioned wanting to go back, and Mister Laurie is like, "Oh no, don't do that! Don't you love your family? Don't go over there." And he's right. like, "Yeah, yeah, I know, I can't go." But then when the situation came up to help his friend, then he went. So it was it was noble. Yeah, it's just knowing what's going to happen, it's hard. I'm like, no, no, right, right, and. Because he does believe that the citizens would all appreciate him because they, I don't know, it makes sense that they would have because his case is that I tried to give everything back to you. I, I'm, I want to say I'm one of you just because I was born as an, as an Evermont doesn't mean that I wanted to be one. I tried to denounce it and renounce it and move on. And so he thought that they would love that, but they didn't. Because they were well, so caught up like in their ways. Their first trial they did and they let him go, which is right. That's true. Absolutely amazing. So I guess he had that going for him. Right. If yeah. So for the first trial. <laughs> yeah. So so he gets taken prisoner. And in the first trial, then and now this trial, it takes him like a year just to get to that trial. And but because of the doctor, because he was a prisoner in the Bastille for 19 years, he's basically the, the public hero because he was he's the poster child of being mistreated by the man, if you would. Then he was mistreated by the aristocracy. And so everybody loves him. And so because and so now not only is Charles a good arist- aristocrat that re- that renounced everything, he's also married to the doctor's daughter. And so now the doctor's vouching for him. And I was like. Oh, what a great guy. We love this guy. Let him free. And so he's free. And for like a few hours. So Charles, he, like I said, he's out for a day, roughly. And then 
new information comes along and we find out that he's been renounced by Madame Defarge and they have a second trial. And at that trial, we learned why the doctor was imprisoned for 19 years because of terrible things that were done by Charles's father and uncle, like really bad stuff. And so, but Charles isn't guilty for it, but they're, but they're treating him like he is. And now, but because of everything that happened, Dr. Manette wrote a note while he was in prison and hid it behind a rock or a brick. And that note was found. And in the note, Dr. Manette also denounces uh, the Evermonds. And, and so then even the doctor and can't save him. something about even all their posterity. I mean, he's understandably angry. Right. And, you know, I thought it was interesting when he wrote that note, he'd been in prison like 10 years. Yeah. He was still sane after 10 years, but he mentioned that he felt he was starting to lose it at that point. Right. So he had a strong constitution. That's true. And so now second trial, total bust, and Charles is basically just doomed. Oh, wait. Yeah, uh-huh. We're going to go back a second because we okay. talked a lot about the doctor. And one of the things that I really loved was at first when he went and he was like kind of a hero. And right. they able to use that to help Charles. And that oh, really yeah. gave uh-huh. him a sense of purpose that everything he had been through, that something, actually something good could come of it. And I think that, you know, can be really helpful for people that have experienced trauma to find some meaning in it in some way. I think that's why often you see people that have trauma go into you know, counseling professions and social work because they want to turn their pain into something that could be of use that could help other people. And so I just really like that part where he's able to use that to help, right? And then imagine how crushing then when this letter comes forward that he thought was destroyed with the Bastille, if he even remembered writing it. Right. I think he did say he thought it had been destroyed with the Bastille. But, uh, and so he went from being, you know, a hero and some purpose and suffering to this just traumatic, you know, total opposite. It's just, again, that juxtaposition that we've been talking about. It's just, oh, it's just heart wrenching. Yeah. And, and in that process, then he goes from being Dr. Manette, the hero who survived all this stuff and is sent out to go and keep on trying to work and then comes back and he's, 105 North Tower again. Just he he's had that dissociative flip again because of the despair and hopelessness. He's lost all hope, and that's enough to trigger him back into um, basically his alternative identity, his alternative identity. And 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 to yeah. our point earlier, he's very upset that his his shoe bent is right. gone. And right. I what think are we going to do if I was. can't finish the shoes tonight? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, I know we disagree on that. But that's that's good. I think some some disagreement makes the conversation more interesting. More than right. oh yeah, yeah, you're so awesome. But uh, yeah, see, I think that made that moment more difficult for him because he didn't have his his bet. Yeah, and that's probably true. And so, and and yeah, and so it, it, that is a really good point. Is that when you go through s- something terrible. There's nothing you can do about it except for move on and now, but how do you move on? And, uh, this book talks about different ways to move on. And that's kind of a cool thing about it is you see different ways to recall yourself to life or to die young. And, and granted, that's not saying anything about anyone who's going through a certain situation and if they're being recalled to life or dying young or whatever it may be, because the situation you're in is unique to yourself. But I, I do like that this book tackles the different sides of it. And and it yeah, it is at this time when this second trial is taking place and everybody's everything's hopeless that Sidney Carton comes around and being the smart guy he is, he comes up with this really elaborate plan that nobody knows about because but I'm sure a lot of people would be like, uh, no, you can't do that. And they would stand in his way. But he, when, when all this happens, oh, just one more note about Charles. I think it's really great because at the end of the, at the end of the trial, 
then they allow Charles to talk to his family for just a minute. And Dr. Monette is obviously like just a mess. He's like, I, he's like, I never meant for any of this to affect you and just tear apart my family and do all this terrible stuff. And Charles is like, look, I don't hold you at fault for this at all. I, now we understand what you went through. And he's, he says, I have more respect for you even now because of the terrible things that you've been through in the past. And I don't hold it against you. I, you, there's nothing that could have been done. You're blameless in my eyes. And I want you to take care of double Lucy's and live a happy life. It's not your fault. And he, I just think that's really great. He's not like, oh, it's because this old man wrote this paper and now I'm going to get my head cut off. He forgives him. He says, you know what? You went through a hard time and you did great. Proud of you. Now go on and live. You're so right. And, you know, I think for us as the reader, it's easy to say, well, of course it's not the doctor's fault. But here's Charles condemned to death. It would right. be after being free. If, yeah, it would be understandable if he lashed out at the doctor just because, you know, he's hurt and scared and angry. But he didn't, which you're right, says a lot about him to keep his composure in that moment. Right. Pretty- and so... And so Charles is left. He's taken to back to La Force prison. And then um, Lucy faints. And but Sydney's there and he he actually he's there just in time. And he picks her up and he says, shall I take her to the coach? I shall never feel her weight, which is just a really sweet thing. He's just a really great guy. And he says, and then he lays her down in, in the coach and he's going to go and start working on his plan. And, but when he's laying her down in the coach, putting her down, then he he whispers her something in her ear that nobody heard except for he says, Charles Dickens says that Lucy heard, the, the child Lucy heard and then would tell her grandchildren later that Sydney told, whispered to Lucy in her ear, a life you love, which is just a nod to that promise he had made before that there's someone who's willing to give his life for a life you love. And so that's the first hint that uh, Sydney is going to take Charles's place because nobody in the book knows if you haven't read it until just about the end, because he keeps it all kind of like close to the chest. And, and so he meets with uh, John, Bar- John Bassad because he's a turnkey so he can get into the prison uh, because he's a spy. And he's and- kind of kid. I got uh-huh. the impression they kind of blackmailed him, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Or Todd wouldn't have gone along with the plan. But yeah, 100%. Right. Yeah, he pulls yeah. out the fact that he worked for the aristocracy, that he's an Englishman, that he is actually an enemy to freedom, that like he has like a whole, a whole handful of different points. And he's like, so uh, are you going to help me out or not? <laughs> <laughs> you also just as a fun note, find out that John... Barsard is actually uh, Miss Mrs. Pross's brother Solomon. I don't know why that has any relevance, um, but it does. So, <laughs> yeah, poor Mrs. Pross. He's so happy to see him, but right? He's and not happy. And he's to like, see he's like, don't get me killed, woman. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyways, so as as things go on, then he. Yeah, so so Sydney goes out and he makes this plan and he tells Mr. Laurie, he's like, okay, this is what you're going to have to do. You've got to get everybody on the carriage by two o'clock because I overheard the Defarges and they're going to uh, renounce Lucy, the doctor, and even the child, even the six-year-old girl, they're going to get send them all to the guillotine to get their heads cut off, which is just horrible. And... And so he says, you got to make sure everybody's on there and make sure that I'm on there and then get out of here and make sure that we go. And, but don't leave before I get there. And when I get there, you're going, nothing, nothing can stop you. You're leaving at two o'clock when I'm, when I'm there. And, and so then, uh, Sydney goes and he, he meets Charles in his prison and he's like, okay, I, I need you to write this note. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So he's like, I need you to write this note. Um, and I'm summarizing real, real strongly. But, and Charles is like, why am I writing a note? And, but he's like, okay, I'll, I'll listen to you because I didn't expect to see you here. Charles didn't even know Sydney was in France at all. 
And so he's writing this note and then he's like, what's that? What's that smell? And so he's like, oh, what, what smell? What are you talking about? And he's like, uh, it must have just been something I picked up. And he's, and he's like, okay. And so he's writing this note basically saying, telling, it's, it's a note from Sydney saying that like, to Lucy saying that I, in a sense that I died for you so that you guys, your family can be together. And yeah. If you recall the conversation that we had, it's so beautiful. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, every time I read this ending, I, I get emotional. I don't get to, to the point of crying, but I get pretty close and I don't cry for much. I cried and I don't cry often. <laughs> right. And so, and so then you have, and so Sydney, he, he basically had chloroform chloroform. And so what he does is he makes Charles look exactly like he did when he walked in, he being Sydney. So they swap places like the parent trap, but in prison. And <laughs> I love that. Right. right. And so, and so now Sydney looks like Charles and since he's coherent and, and aware, and now Charles is chloroformed and knocked out, then he tells John, okay, now get him out of here. And John's like, you better not tell people that you're not Charles or else we're all dead. We're all dead. And he's like, dude, why would I do that? That's not going to help anybody. He's like, just make sure that that Charles gets on that carriage so that they can be safe. And long story short, they do. They He gets on the carriage and he's safe and they're able to get out of France. But Sydney stays in the prison. And Miss Pross and Madame Defarge, they get into a fight and it's it's actually it's actually kind of a interesting end that uh Miss or that Miss Defarge, her vengeance and her desire for revenge is what kills her in the end because she brings a pistol to finish the job of the Manettes. And in her fight with Miss Proston, she ends up shooting herself, which unfortunately makes Miss Prost deaf, which is funny because she's just such a loud, always talking person. So now she's going to be even louder. I, I don't know if Charles Dickens did that on purpose. He probably did, but I don't know why else he would make her deaf. Um, if anyone has any thoughts on why Miss Prost becomes deaf, deaf in the end, uh, let us know. Cause I think that's interesting. Yeah. There must be a reason. Right. But all that to be said. So now, now Charles or now Sydney is in the prison and getting ready to be executed. And he, he meets this little seamstress lady and she tells him that. Who, like we said, was a peasant. that somehow right. got caught up in this. Thing. Right. She's like, well, what, what could I do to anybody? I'm just a tiny little woman. <laughs> and, and, but she finds strength in Sydney's presence because he is, she finds out, she says, wait, he recognizes it. right. She's like, wait a minute. She, you're not, you're not Charles. And he's like, Shh, don't, Charles. don't tell anybody. <laughs> and she's like, wait, so, you, so you're dying for him. And he, and he's like, yes. And, and for, for his wife and his child. And she's like, she's like, can I hold your hand? I, I think that you can help provide me strength. I, I feel like God sent you to me. And um, Sydney says, you know, I, I think that God sent you to me too. And they're able to comfort each other and until the end which wasn't very long but it's, it's a very beautiful it's short just, relationship so touching that they have each other right last month. yeah and so i think and now so I'll, I'll i'll read this last passage and then we'll just kind of give our closing thoughts on all this because i normally like the endings charles dickens gives this one i i wish we had a little bit more but I get it. He wanted to focus on the fact that Sydney is the the unsuspecting hero in this story. And so he leaves it on a on a sad note. He doesn't let us be able to go see Charles and Lucy go home and have a great happy life. But he does let us have a little glimpse. And he does this by saying that if Sydney was given a paper to write and a statement about what he prophesied would happen being prophetic and Charles Dickens being the author is able to say that he was prophetic in these thoughts. Uh, these are what's, this is what Sydney would have 
This is what Sidney envisioned happening. And what Charles Dickens is basically saying is true. It happened. And, and it's the ending that we don't get details on. But it says, and this is Sidney talking from seconds before, maybe as the guillotine is falling. He says, I see, I see her with a child upon her bosom who bears my name. I see her father, aged and bent, but otherwise restored and faithful to all men in his healing office and at peace. I see the good old man, so long their friend, in ten years, time uh, enriching them. Uh, yes, sorry. So, so long their old friend, in ten years' time, enriching them with all he has and passing tranquilly to his reward. Now that would make him about ninety-eight or eighty-nine years old, Mister, and that's Mister Laurie. So, saying that Mister Laurie was with them to the end, and 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 just as a quick note, I think I don't want to lose his train of thought, but Mister Laurie, he starts this story as a machine, and he becomes a human again. He's it's like Beauty and the Beast. He's he goes from being like Cogsworth the clock to Mister Laurie. The, the grandpa essentially and <laughs> and so he, he he just cares for this this little family and it's become such a big part of him that he he shows emotion more than just business and it's just it's just great for him I'm and it's really awesome uh now back to the quote it says I see that I hold a sanctuary in their hearts and in the hearts of their descendants and generations hence, I see her, an old woman, weeping for me on the anniversary of this day. I see her and her husband, their course done, laying side by side in their last earthly bed. I know that each was not more honored or held uh, or held sacred in the other soul than I was in, in both of their souls. I see the child who who laid upon her bosom and bore my name, a man, a, a man winning his way up in the path of life, which once was mine. I see, I see him, him winning so well that my name is also made more illustrious there by the light of his. I see the blots I threw upon it fade, fade away. I see him, a foremost of judges and honored men, bringing a boy of my name with a forehead that I know and golden hair to this place, then fair to look upon with not a trace of this day's disfigurement. And I hear him tell the child my story with a tender and faltering voice. It is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done before. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known. And that's the end. That's it. And this is Sidney Carton's recall to life. And he was, in a sense, resurrected um, through Lucy's son. That Lucy's son, being who they named Sidney in honor of the sacrifice that he made. And so now, Sid now Charles and Lucy both have such a high esteem and honor for Sydney for dying for them. It's, it's in a sense, uh, Sydney is, is like a type of Christ in this story is that Sydney died for, for them, not for their sins, but so that they could live and so that they could be together as a family. And so they respect and honor, uh, Sydney Carton almost in the same way that people respect and honor Jesus Christ, because he died so that they could live and for Charles so that he could live again. And he also was able to, uh, he was able to move up. He was able to allow them to live as a family. And so, which is just a really great end for Sydney, but it doesn't end there, which is awesome because then Lucy and Charles, they name their son after him. And, he not only has his same name, but also goes and lives on his same profession. He becomes a lawyer and a judge, and he's very honorable. And since he has the same name, then in a sense, he's rewriting the wrongs that Sidney had done in the past, which is 
uh, Sidney Carton's recall to life through through death in a sense. And it's just what a beautiful story. And if you haven't read it, then go pick it up, read it, because spoilers, you know, you know the, nearly the whole story, but we couldn't even get into the just a 10th percent of all the great things that are in this book and what we talked about you might find some even better things so for sure check it out and, and i want to hear your thoughts on it mama let me know uh what are kind of your concluding thoughts well i think yeah, you know, it's what you're saying about spoilers it's like you and i read it we both read it before right so we knew what's going to happen but it doesn't matter like i know so many things this time that I had missed in previous readings. And just, oh, it's just such a beautiful story. Each time I read it, it's, you know, it touches me in a different way, you know? And talking to you about it, I got more things out of it than I would have alone. It just, oh, you know, one of the things I love about reading classics is, you know, the writers, they had such a great understanding of human nature. And so it's like, I don't know, the best, psychology lesson reading Charles Dickens or, yeah you know that was true get such a better understanding about people through reading a story it's just amazing and it's funny to me because I did cry even though I knew what was going to happen spoiler alert I know that he's going to die for his friends and I still cried so and right so it and for me it's not even at the end Right. It's not even at the end that I that I cry when it's done. Is is when he's making the preparations and when he's realizing. There's a point where um, it says that he and it, he was in a sense he was walking, but in a it, like a wanderer who had long lost their path but had now found it. And it's like he found his purpose in dying for somebody. And it's that it finding that his life wasn't worth anything because of what he had done, but that it he finally found out that his life was worth something because it could save somebody and save the lives of those that he does love. And so by giving his life, he found it. And it's just, it's, it's just, it's such a beautiful narrative. You know, it's funny because that's kind of what happened with the doctor too. That yeah, that's true. He found that giving, you know, giving himself, he could help Charles. That like renewed him and gave him new life to be able to use his use his pain to help somebody, which is what Sydney did. I think that's another just another theme there. Charles Dickens is brilliant, you know. You're right, and that's why I like to say that I hope they were friends. <laughs> so, well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us on Shrinking Classics. I hope that you enjoyed our discussion of Tale of Two Cities. We couldn't even get into everything that we wanted to talk about. So maybe one day, we'll, maybe next year around this time, we'll talk about it again and talk about a different theme that we see in it. Uh, but thanks for listening with us and tune in next time for A Christmas Carol, which we will be reading in honor of Christmas coming up. So, well, thank you for listening and we will hear from you next week or you'll hear from us.